So the other day I started wondering, what would happen if you ran a CNC mill without a spindle? And well, this happened. Lesson learned. A CNC without a spindle is just a very confused machine. Let's fix that. All the axes and limit switches are up and running, so it's time to work on the spindle box. I've got some 12 millimeter plate that'll do the job, and the spindle is a 1.5 kilowatt water-cooled unit with an ER16 collet. It came with a VFD and a cast mounting bracket, which, let's be honest, might as well have been sculpted by hand. There's nothing square or straight on it, but this is the best I can do to align it without breaking out a chisel. To mount the spindle box, I need to machine two parts to attach it to the Z-axis. Kind of hard to do without a working machine. So, I made a temporary fixture. It's not pretty, but it works. But enough about me. It's at this point my mini lathe decided to let the secret smoke escape. Yep, it fried its electronics. And as we all know, once the smoke is out, it's pretty hard to put it back in. So I had to use a temporary hack. And if there's one thing we all know about temporary fixes, it's that they work just long enough to become permanent. I'm not sure if there's a special department for making off-center collets, but their very best guy made this one. So I ordered AA-grade collets, and the only difference, as far as I can tell, is that the box has an extra A on it. I guess the AA stands for absolutely awful, or maybe always askew. It was better after I removed the surprise gift of free stock they hid inside. I found an OLED display from a half-finished project, because of course. Since the VFD can output its current load, I figured, why not put it to good use and display that, along with the stepper and spindle temperatures. Now I can keep an eye on everything. I'm not too sure about the stepper's cooling being trapped inside the frame. I will add more to the display later. Only after cutting the part did I notice the software that came with the controller didn't accurately set the zero offset. Or maybe I slipped up somewhere. Repeating the process manually, though? 100% repeatable. Lots more to learn. I'm not pushing the machine hard here. I just need to get these two parts done. And I've not only got two or three end mills, but one to work with. And not just any end mill. It's one of those ultra-cheap $2 specials. Fingers crossed it holds together long enough to finish the job.
Cuts look okay. Luckily, there aren't any tight tolerances here. Only these two faces were cut, so I can somewhat trust the other side to still be square. I'll use those as the interfaces to mount the spindle box. One side is tapped to M5 and they are done. when the walk isn't optional, but dramatic resistance definitely is. Dog park it is. I had a comment about the enclosure having open swinging doors being a mistake. And yeah, they're absolutely right. Chips do love making their great escape. But I needed a way to access the entire machine for assembly and to fix it when things inevitably go wrong. Don't worry though, I've got a plan to stop the chips. Or at least make them think twice before they try anything. Is this a machine for ants? I'll admit, I was worried that using 20mm rails instead of 15mm was overkill for this build. Sure, I could have gone with a smaller footprint and 15mm rails, but CAD designs can be so deceptive. You zoom in too much, and suddenly everything looks the same size. Looking at it now, I'm glad I went with the 20mm rails. Alright, let's talk tramming. Here's a super simple setup. One axis, a work plate, and a spindle. Looking perfect, right? But real life doesn't play by the rules. Watch as the work plate gets thicker on one side. Yep, things are already off. Now let's rotate the spindle a little to the right. It's like trying to cut with a tool that's had one too many coffees. Now throw in a workpiece and simulate a cut. 
The result? A disaster. The cut's all over the place, and the workpiece looks like it was filed by a gorilla with a grudge. This is why tramming matters. If the spindle's not aligned, even a simple cut can go south. Tramming keeps everything nice and square so your cuts don't end up looking like abstract art. Next, we need something flat and straight to check our alignment. I grabbed some thick glass. Let's go ahead and place it on the work plate. Next, fix a dial indicator to the spindle housing. Then, start shimmying the glass until it's level with the axis. It's like a high-stakes game of Jenga, but with fewer falling pieces and more measuring. With the dial indicator attached to the spindle, it's time to start sweeping, and we'll focus on one axis at a time. As the spindle is rotated to the right, you'll notice something interesting. When the indicator is on the left, it's lower, closer to the work plate. But when it's on the right, it's higher, like the spindle is leaning over to take a peek. Here's a close-up view of the indicator while it sweeps, so you can see just how off things are. This is what we're fixing, because right now this spindle alignment is as straight as a politician's promise. By rotating the spindle in the right direction, we can get the difference between the two opposite readings to converge to zero. Like magic, but with way more precision. And here's a pro tip. The further away we move the dial indicator from the spindle, the more accurate our measurements become. It's like using a longer lever, like more leverage, less guesswork. Just don't go overboard, or you'll end up measuring the neighbor's table instead. I had about a millimeter of fall from the front to the back, but with a bit of luck and some aluminum foil as a shim, I got it spot on. Then I repeated the process for the x-axis. It's as close as I can get it, and honestly, that's good enough for me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.